challenge anybody that's listening to me that has an issue with polygyny to provide scripture so that I can embarrass you. I would love for anyone to challenge me. I would love for anyone to step forward. Come forward. I challenge and welcome everybody. All of you scholars, all of you, you Bible thumpers, all of you Christians, even you Israelites that are lost, who believe in monogamy. But I challenge anybody to come forward to prove that polygyny is sinful. Okay, we will address all these lies that they tell here in the Polygyny is a Package Deal series. Now, this is Polygyny is a Package Deal Part 1. What I mean by polygyny is a package deal is that you need all the components to the law of Moses in order to practice polygyny and fulfill holiness, which is what God is all about. All right. So let's get right into it. Now, throughout this series, we will thoroughly exhibit why polygyny was permitted under the old covenant and is not today. First, there is a difference between polygamy and polygyny. Polygamy is when a man or woman have multiple spouses. Polygyny is when a man has multiple wives and sometimes concubines. Polygamy has never been permitted and is a detestable thing before God, but they are both paths to hell. In order to understand why it is sinful, we must understand the five major curses against men. Okay, there's a curse against humanity. We know this because all men die. The scriptures say through Adam, sin came into the world. Because Adam was perpetuated through sin into a fallen state. That's a curse that comes upon all men. Okay, so that's the first major curse. But in no particular order. Okay, there are also generational curses within the immediate proximity of men, within their immediate bloodline. Okay, Deuteronomy 5 verse 8 says, God visits the iniquity of the father down to the children, up to the third and fourth generations. Okay, so the sins of your father pass down to you. Okay, the sins of your grandfather, great-grandfather up to the third and fourth generation, all right? And when those children continue to sin, they continue that bloodline curse. You see what I'm saying? There's also the curse of you sinning as an individual. That's self-explanatory, okay? The wages of sin is death, okay? You reap what you sow, all right? When you commit fornication, you sin against your own body. There are curses that you commit, okay, that attract spirits, and you may not have to pay the penalty for that immediately. As the scriptures say, because the sentence is not executed expediently, man is fully set in his heart to continue wickedness. Okay, so some curses you don't pay for until years after you commit iniquity. All right. Then there's a curse against the nation. When a whole nation practices wickedness, okay, a curse comes upon that land and a curse comes upon the people in that land. Okay, this ultimately is how Christ is going to come back and destroy the earth. Okay, because when the people in the land, the people in the nation, when they come into agreement to practice many abominable things, that provokes the most high. Okay, and that's a curse on a larger scale. Okay, because it impacts more people. Then, lastly, there's a curse against every race of people. Every race has its own peculiar curse against them. Okay, this is where we get to talking about Deuteronomy 28. We all know the curses that have come upon the so-called black man. Okay, for disobeying the Most High. Also, the children of Israel, their descendants, said that they want Christ's blood on their hands and on their children's hands. Okay, this is why the so-called white man in this dispensation is above the so-called black man. 
You see what I'm saying? But the scriptures also talks about something called strong delusion, deceitfulness of riches. So every race of people have gotten their captivity or their servitude, except the so-called white man. Right now, he's in a prominent position, but the scriptures prophesy of his destruction because he set his face against the most high. But I don't have time to get into that in this video. I'll get into that deeper into this series. But there you have it. Those are the five major curses. Okay, there's a curse against humanity. All men die. There are generational curses. The sins of your father pass down to the third and fourth generation. Okay, there are curses that come upon you for the individual sins that you commit. Then there's a curse against the nation. People come into agreement and vote for the president. That's why you're not supposed to vote, giving your agreement to these wicked men. Okay? That's agreement that you sponsor what, whatever abomination these clowns support. So I just wanted to set that framework, okay, when we're talking about polygyny is a package deal. Okay? Because obviously... The children of Israel had a covenant with the Most High that they broke, all right? And they were evicted from their land, which was the foundation of their practice and servitude to the Most High, okay? So polygyny, sex is worship, okay? So the sacrifices that they were making was pleasing to God at some point but through these blood covenants, all right, again, which satisfied holiness. First, we're going to introduce Enoch. Then we're going to come back to Enoch. All right, so we're going to go to Genesis chapter 5. And we're going to read from verse 21 to 24. It says, Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God. 300 years and had sons and daughters. So this man walked with God for 300 years. All right. Keep that in mind. Verse 23. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not. For God took him. Okay. Many of these theologians and these false prophets they have dismissed the book of Enoch and this is hearsay okay because the bible makes reference to Enoch so much to the point where in the book of Jude Jude talks about the testimony of Enoch but if Enoch had a testimony why is it not written in detail in the scriptures Okay, and this man was so important that he walked with God for 300 years and he has nothing to say. 300 years of walking with God. So this is where we go to Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22, starting at verse 18 and reading to verse 19. It says, verse 18, For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. See, God wouldn't have said this if men the wicked men who remove books from the bible the bible has more than 66 books okay and it has more than the books that are mentioned that geno jennings referred to like the book of jasher no it has more than that okay the book of enoch is legitimate okay they took it from the scriptures because they don't want people to know about demonic spirits Okay, where they come from. Enoch talked about hell. He talked about demon spirits. He talked about the fallen angels and why they were sentenced. 
All right, to eternal lake of fire. We'll talk about that. But why is Enoch important? Because in order for us to really dig at the root of why polygyny is a package deal, and since we cannot practice the law of Moses in the land of our captivity, you cannot practice polygyny. See, the thing that a lot of these reprobates don't talk about is during the time of slavery, the transatlantic slave trade. Okay, these slaves constantly had these Edomites sleeping with their wives. All right, now does that fulfill holiness? Of course not. Okay, again, it's a generational curse against our people. It says it in the book of Deuteronomy 28. You will take a wife and another man will lay with her. Okay, we know in the eyes of God, that is wickedness. Okay, so to be able to take multiple wives and to have all this blood being mixed, especially with the heathen, okay, what really what happened in slavery is this wicked white man with his spirit of rebellion in our women. Okay, and to this day is something that he practices. He teaches our women to steal. Okay, that's what the devil does. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Okay, child support is stealing. Okay, the so called white man has stole everything he's got, everything he's inherited is lies. The scriptures say he's inherited lies from his father. Okay, it's built off of treachery. So he doesn't pay reparations. He, you know, doesn't do what's right in the eyes of the Most High. That's why the Most High says he hates Esau. Okay, but again, I'll get into that deeper into this series. Okay, because we have to talk about the matriarchal kingdom and all of the components to this wicked society. Okay, which favors the woman, which favors the weaker vessels. All right, this is stuff that your pastor is not going to talk about because he's 501c3. Who were the first to impart their rebellion into the women? Okay, it was the fallen angels. The fallen angels made it with the daughters of men. And Enoch proves this. Let's go to the book of John, chapter 8, verse 44. Then we're going to go to Genesis chapter 3. So, this is Christ talking to the Jews, okay, who obviously did not believe that he was God. Verse 44, he says, You are of your father, the devil. Catch that. See, a lot of these theologians just take that as that being a metaphor. No, he literally means that. You are of your father, the devil. How did the devil become a father? Okay, this is why we have to be born again. We have to be born again, washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay, that's a blood covenant for salvation because your father, the devil, corrupted the DNA of men. It goes on, he says, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning. Okay, what murder did he commit? People said, well, he got into Cain. First of all, how did demons inherit access to possess men? How did they inherit access to the blood of men? You can only demon possess through the bloodlines of men. Again, these generational curses, who are the administers of these curses? Okay, the scriptures talk about the strong man that comes in to bind a man and steal his goods. Okay, the spirit realm is much more deeper than this fleshly realm. Okay, a lot of people got this veil over their eyes where they can't understand these things. So he says he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar 
and the father of it. Okay, let's go to Genesis chapter 3. Okay, starting at verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden. Verse 3. But of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Okay. First of all, you have a serpent that is talking to a woman. Okay. At this time, animals were able to talk until God closed the mouths of the animals. Okay, we can see in the book of Numbers or Deuteronomy where Balaam wanted to curse the children of Israel and he was talking to a donkey because God opened the mouth of the donkey. Okay, so this was, a, this was an animal whom I believe may have been possessed by a spirit. But then again, it's real complex because the spirit realm was bridged with the natural realm. I do not believe it was literal fruit and that it was a literal tree. Okay, fruit is a metaphor that the scriptures speak of for the deeds of men or the deeds of a person. They didn't get cursed for eat, biting into a fruit. Okay, but verse four, then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. See, he came to the woman, the weaker vessel. As I've stated before, I'll say it again. The woman is the weaker vessel. It is her who was deceived by the serpent. You see, verse six. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise she took of its fruit and ate she also gave to her husband with her and he ate okay eating is is taking in receiving there's something that they received okay i'll get into that in part two of this series verse seven then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew that they were naked and they sold fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? Verse 10, so he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, verse 11, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Okay, so this was the beginning of the spirit realm, there being a veil established separating the spirit realm and the natural realm because Adam was cut off at this point. It was equivalent to a blind man suffocating to breathe. And I'll explain that. Adam went blind when he was cut off from the spirit realm. He used to be able to see in both realms. Okay. So this was an affliction that he was suffering. That's why he, he had to hear God now. He could no longer see God because he had sin. God cannot be in the presence of sin. But he could hear God as clear as day. See, this is another generational curse. Because now we hear dimly. We see dimly. Okay? We can't hear God as, as clear unless we fast and pray. And get into his word. But Adam, as you can see in Genesis 4, even Cain 
okay, a reprobate, even he could hear God clear, okay? This was, again, sin is incredibly expensive. It keeps taking things away from us. So when these guys say, well, they practice polygyny in the Old Testament, why can't we practice it now in the New Testament? They lack understanding and looking at this long list of things that have been taken away from us because of sin, okay, including us going into captivity, being evicted from our own land. But they never go into that stuff. They like to take the sexy things from the law of Moses and just include that into whatever wickedness they practice in today. Okay, a lot of these guys just lack self-control. I mean, that's really what this boils down to. And as I stated before, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, emphasizes self-control. Under the law of Moses, if men didn't have self-control, and they slept with another man's wife, okay, it could cost them their life. There's your self-control. Okay, the New Testament is something called the sting of death. Okay, so the penalty for disobeying the law of grace, again, because the sentence is not executed immediately, man is fully set in his heart to commit wickedness. All right, the penalty is the lake of fire. And therefore, people went off deep into strong delusion because they think that their sin is okay with God and it's not. All right. So, as I said, Adam was cut off. He, he was blind at this point. Verse 12. Then the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. Okay. What if I told you the terms that we use for the flesh, eating and fruit and tree? What if I told you those words were originally words of the spirit okay because first comes the spirit then the natural so when we're reading this we're thinking they literally ate a fruit no they didn't literally eat a fruit okay there was some things that they received that was from these fallen angels and i'll get into that more in part two verse 13 and the lord god said to the woman what is this you have done the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Verse 14. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman. And between your seed and her seed. Okay, catch that. Does the woman have a seed? No, we know that this is speaking of the woman being a vessel giving birth to the men who produce seed. Okay, but the seed of the woman, we know this is talking about Christ. Okay, Mary giving birth to Christ, the seed of man starts with God who created man. So this is not Joseph from the lineage of Judah, then eventually Joseph having sex with Mary to give no. That's blasphemy. Okay. The seed of Christ stems back to God who put the breath in the nostrils of Adam. You see what I'm saying? And so and we obviously this does not mean her seed, as in the woman producing seed. But why does it say the serpent has a seed? Okay, if there was no sex involved. Okay, Genesis 6. I don't have time to go to that in this video, but Genesis 6 says there was a day when the sons of God, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth. Okay, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful. Well, this is when men begin to multiply on the face of the earth. Okay, but let's read on. It says, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. 
in pain, you shall bring forth children. Okay, so before this, Eve did not have a menstrual cycle. Where did the blood flow come from? Okay, now she's losing life. You see what I'm saying? Again, sin is now taking things from her. Okay, the scriptures say in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, that he who commits fornication sins against his own body. Okay, so for God to curse that area of her body proves that she committed fornication. She did not do it with Adam because Adam is her husband. Couple this with the fact that the serpent has a seed. In John chapter 8, verse 44, it says the devil is a father. Father, seed. Are you connecting the two? Because you got people who are arguing with me that this did not happen. No, you got to study to show yourself approved. This, again, I'm giving you scripture here, and I'm going to list this in the description box. All right? Where did this curse come from? Again, this is a curse on the woman. Genesis 3.16 is a curse on the woman. Okay? Continuing on, it says, Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Verse 17, Then to Adam he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. There go your, your curse against humanity. I had to set the framework talking about generational curses, introducing Enoch, okay, talking about how the serpent has a seed in this part one, okay, because Later in this series, we're going to see that as time progresses, the serpent seed begins to multiply on the earth. Okay, and this was 6,000 years ago. Okay, so this is why there's so much godlessness and there's so much practice of pagan worship and that they're starting to use sex as worship. Okay, because now the women are not nowhere near as holy as they were under the law of Moses, because there is no self-control, okay? The self-control, again, which I'll get into in part two, what is the penalty for a man sleeping with another man's wife? Not only sleeping with another man's wife, but even if he slept with another man's concubine, he would not be put to death, but he would have to pay a heavy price for that out of his pocket. So. These are the questions I'm listing here. Why is Lucifer on Lake Roll? Okay. When I say Lucifer, I'm using that word. We know Lucifer was a fallen was a fallen angel. He used to be a cherub angel and he became a fallen angel. Okay. But I'm using that term just to so that you can understand what I'm talking about. When I speak of Lucifer, I'm talking about fallen angels and demons. Okay, because there's a difference between a fallen angel and a demon. A demon is the offspring of that union between a fallen angel and a woman. So, number one, why is Lucifer on Lake Road? What is it exactly that he did to land himself in a situation where he's going to be cast into the lake of fire? Speaking about demons and fallen angels. Number two, where did the serpent seed come from? Okay, I gave you surface level understanding here in part one. Part two, we're going to go deeper into the book of Enoch, as we also did introducing Enoch. All right. Number three, how did Satan become a murderer in the beginning? Okay, we're going to tie this other scriptures to Genesis three. 
Number four, how is the devil a father? Five, why did God curse Eve with a perpetual monthly menstrual cycle? We're going to tackle all of this as the series progresses. Okay. Again, we're hitting the root of why polygyny is a package deal with the law of Moses, where men were allowed to have multiple wives and concubines, but there were consecrations and a penal system against adulterers to quarantine the Israelites from the contagion of demon DNA, okay? When a person committed adultery, they had to be stoned to death to cast the demon out. So since the penalty for adultery was so severe, they had documentation for wives and concubines that belonged to the men, all right? but. That's all I'm going to teach in this part one. We'll continue part two. So stay tuned and enjoy the rest of your day.